cost anything. But for me, it has been quite a heartfelt experience to be uh, a part of this process and to witness the incredible generosity of Canadians to welcome all these refugees to our country. Uh, so it kind of goes beyond economics, it's apart from economics, it's been noted by other countries. But to see Canadians rise up in such enthusiasm to greet these 25,000 new Canadians from a terrible life, to welcome them here, has been for me a truly uh, heartwarming experience. But I don't want to talk more about refugees. I, I'm happy to answer any questions about anything. I always prefer the question part, and so my speech will not be any longer than 10 minutes, the longest. Uh, so I'll answer questions about anything you want. But I will under wear more of my economist hat today, since I'm talking to a business crowd largely. And I, to remind you that the Immigration Department is not just about refugees, important as they are, and even though they've been added to my title. So, I'm not the Minister of Refugees only, and as someone reminded me, that has an unfortunate acronym. Minister of Refugees only is like moron, so I don't want to be a moron. So I will focus mainly on so-called economic immigrants. By the way, I don't like the word economic immigrants, because it implies that there are these useful immigrants who are economic and rather useless ones who are non-economic. And that's wrong, because everyone contributes in one way or another to the economy. So-called economic immigrants, some of them are spouses who aren't working. Family class, many of them work, and even the parents and grandparents who may not work themselves enable the two parents to work, and most of the refugees work. So all immigrants are economic to one degree or another. And so I will focus mainly on what we call economic immigrants, but with that little caveat in mind. Uh, before I get on to that, though, I wanted to say a few words about what we've done so far and about family class. What we've done so far is we've admitted the 25,000 Syrian refugees, and there's more on the way. 97% uh, of them are now in permanent housing. So that, or 98%. So the main challenge going forward is to help them find jobs and languages. We've reinstated uh, refugee health care. Uh, we've introduced the Citizenship Act to ensure there's only one class of Canadians, not two, and to remove certain barriers to become uh, citizens. And I would say my biggest single campaign commitment, which we have not acted upon yet, but we will be soon, is to reduce the huge processing times for family class immigrants. And that is something very much on my mind, something we are working on. But now I want to come to the uh, so-called economic immigrants. And I agree with what others have said, that our country has been built on immigrants. We are all immigrants at one time or another. And never have we been more dependent on immigration than we are today with our aging population. So we are in competition with other countries, with Australia, with UK, with US and others to seek out the best and the brightest from around the world and induce them to come here. And so everything I do on this front will be designed to facilitate that process, to make us a more attractive destination for these skilled and sometimes less skilled immigrants that our country needs so much. And so some of the systems in place are less than useful to achieve those ends and we will be working to make uh, changes in those areas. So let me just mention three areas. One, the total number of immigrants, the levels. We are at 300,000 now, and I would like that number to be bigger. But the ch first challenge, to paraphrase my former parliamentary colleague, uh, Belinda Stronach, we have to learn how to bake a bigger economic pie. We can talk about how you divide the immigrants between this group and that group, but let's talk first about how we can get more, if that is indeed what we want. And to get more, it's a combination of more money to hire more 
public servants to interview people, and improved efficiency, which is what I am working on very hard. Because what my department learned from the refugee experience, where we brought in so many so quickly, but without sacrificing security or health, is that people can do it, the job fast. And if they can do it fast for refugees, why can't they do it fast for other forms of immigration? I think they can. I've told them they can. I said, this is punishment for good behavior. <laughs> you did it so well over there, you can do the same thing over here. So we are hoping to be able to bake a bigger pie, bring in more immigrants, should we choose to do that. And we will be entering into consultations in the coming months with all forms of stakeholders, certainly including business, labor, everybody you can imagine, provincial governments, because we're going to have a three-year plan for levels coming up to be announced in the fall for 2017, 18, and 19. And it's important to grow the number of that's what we want to do. And it's also important to decide within that number how many of each type would we want to bring in. Because we all agree, I think, that immigration is critical, never been more critical. So we have to try to get the numbers right, and we have to get the mix right. But I'll just mention two other areas in which I am working hard. One is we want to admit more international students to become permanent residents of Canada. And I've spoken many times across this country to many different groups. Often people don't agree. But I have not met one person who disputes this premise that it's a good thing for Canada to bring in more international students as permanent residents. Nobody, so maybe someone in this room will disagree. If so, you're the first. So I cannot think of a group of people more appropriate or more beneficial to become permanent residents than international students. They're generally speaking quite young. They can speak English or French. By definition, they have an education. They know something about the country. Why not bring them in? And I think they've been shortchanged by the express entry system in combination with the labor market impact assessment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we've already benefited them on our Citizenship Act by reinstating the 50% credit that international students get for time spent in Canada. I mean, if you want to court international students to get more of them instead of them going to Australia, you want to be nice to them by giving them that credit, not punching them in the nose by taking away that credit. So we're giving that credit back. But more importantly, we'll be adding points to the express entry system to facilitate foreign stu international students to become permanent residents of Canada. Now, peut-être ça veut dire que vous êtes d'accord. S'il y a quelqu'un ici qui n'est pas d'accord que c'est une bonne chose d'admettre les étudiants internationaux, vous pouvez me le dire plus tard parce que vous seriez le premier. <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to do, I said we want to attract the best and the brightest. That means we want to reduce the bureaucracy. We want to make it more flexible. We want uh, companies to be able to go out and hire the people they want to hire without too much bureaucratic rules stopping them. So LMIA, Labor Market Impact Assessment, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that is a process which will say whether you are taking a job away from another Canadian, whether you are needed as a foreigner to come into Canada. It's fine to have that for uh, temporary foreign workers, but I don't think ever in our history we have had such a system applied to permanent residents. Generally speaking, we've wanted to attract the best and the brightest, not impose this kind of test on them. So I question this test. Uh, partly, it's not entirely under my control, and we're working together as a government. But in some areas, I think I might be able, in the not-too-distant future, to reduce some of those barriers to make the system more flexible, so that companies uh, will be able to uh, have greater latitude and freedom to uh, hire the people they think are the ones they truly need. Because, you know, this is not just to make companies happy. This is for the sake of our country. 
because we do have an aging population. We do have great needs, particularly in certain sectors, certain regions, but across the country. And we are in competition with all these other countries to secure the talent. So it only makes sense if you want to promote your own country, which in my case is Canada, is that we improve our immigration system, that we make it easier for businesses to let people in, so that we can truly go out and find the best and the brightest, which is what we as a country need to generate growth and success and progress in coming years. So thank you all very much. Pleasure to talk to you, and I look forward to taking your questions. Sure.